for me to live out my truth. My truth. What do you mean? What do you mean your truth? Truth is not subjective. It's objective. So no, I don't think it's a choice at all. Wow. 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 Homosexuality is not a choice. Where do I begin? This ought to be one of the most interesting videos I've ever seen for a number of reasons. Number one, you're going to see the difference between biblical Christianity and woke ideology being camouflaged under the title of Christianity. But it's pretty interesting. And I'm, I don't mean to use the word more than once here, but it because it serves the purpose of what we're about to discuss today. Pastor Mel, did you have anything to add to is homosexuality a sin? Uh, I certainly don't believe that it is a sin. Uh so what you're about to see here is Marcus Rogers, who is also a minister and also a big time YouTuber. And we have him addressing and speaking, I should say debating, to ministers. And the interesting thing is both of these ministers are homosexuals. So they're arguing the question whether or not homosex homosexuality is a choice. And you got to hear these answers. It's good to hear what the argument from the other side is comparing to the biblical reality. I'll tell you what, man, we are living in serious times, strange times. But again, but we are going to listen to the argument here. And I'm going to let you make your decision. Which one do you believe is telling the truth? Where do you stand when it comes to that? This video has gone viral for a good reason. Um, it is because how far disconnected from biblical interpretation or some of the worldviews being proposed here in the discussion. So I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna take too much of your time. We're gonna get right into the video. So let's get right into it. Um, Pastor Ramel, is homosexuality a choice? It is not. <laughs> if you want okay. to elaborate, I can elaborate, but the, the short answer is it is not. Uh, I don't think that sexuality is a choice. Um, if it were a choice, I would have been straight a long time ago because I chose to be straight many, 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 many times. So it's interesting how we think that homosexuality is a choice, but somehow for gay people, heterosexuality, which they have chosen over and over again, never took. So no, I don't believe it's a choice. Wow, and, and, and I'm just want to ask a follow-up question here. When you say that you chose heterosexuality, heterosexuality over and over again, what exactly do you no, mean? No, he said he would have chose it over and over again. He would have chose heterosexuality yeah. over homosexuality. But it, it sounds like you said you also have tried to choose Correct. heterosexuality as well. I chose it many, many times. Uh, praying, fasting, baptizing myself, anointing myself with all, trying to be straight, trying to be delivered. And so I made that choice, but through that experience of it through over the course of over a decade, I came to realize that sexual orientation is in fact not a choice. Mm, interesting. And uh, Reverend Will, have you found that also to be, uh, to, to be the same experience for yourself? I absolutely have. Um, and, and I think it's important that we add some context uh, to these questions. Cause I think sometimes um, we will, we will posit a particular position and, 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 and I don't think really think through the assertion that we're making. And, and let me give you an example of that. Generally speaking, uh, when somebody makes a choice, when we make a choice, we have certain things that are set before us. Um, and generally we choose those things that are better, uh, more valuable. We choose those things that are easier, we choose those things that are going to uh, promote us or, or advance us. And so the question would be for those who think that homosexuality is a choice, what do you think is better or easier uh, about being homosexual than being heterosexual? Why would someone choose that? Uh, most of the people I know who identify um, as non-heterosexual, because we're going to talk about a spectrum later on, but anyone who identifies as not heterosexual have generally had a pretty tough road to hoe. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's hard at home. It's hard at church. It's hard in society. 
uh, particularly those of us who were raised in Christian households, uh, internally is very difficult. And so generally speaking, people are not going to make a choice to make their life harder. They make a choice to make their life easier. And so, you know, again, the whole idea that someone would choose the hard road, it just doesn't make any sense. And I think people need to be challenged to really think about that. So, no, I don't think it's a choice at all. There you have it. Wow. 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 Homosexuality is not a choice. That's that's just wild. And the argument that he proposed was, why would anybody choose something that is not good, right? Acknowledging that maybe it is not good, confirming the fact that heterosexuality is the norm, homosexuality is abnormal. Could a person choose something that they know is bad for them? Yes, all the time. When a person smokes, right? The first time you try smoking, it's not the best thing, right? But as you continue in the practice, you can change your mindset, even the way you feel about it, to the point where you become used to it, and then it becomes a habit that you embrace. The same is true for alcohol, even drugs, or any other practice. That is oftentimes very much well-known as bad, you can take something that is bad, right? You can make a bad decision and eventually you can take that which is bad and turn it into good, depending on how much you submit yourself to it. That same is true for faith in God. And we're going to address that because before we get into our response, and I'm losing my mind over here, uh, Marcus Rogers is going to respond. You're going to see the difference in his response. Both of these men spoke. You got no Bible, not a single text. And keep in mind, these are ordained ministers in Western America. Well, I think it's time to um, introduce Marcus Rogers and your perspectives here. But uh, because, you know, I'm sure you he you've heard this conversation uh, prior on your end as well um, about whether or not you know, gay men have the opportunity to choose whether or not to be in that lifestyle. What's your perspective as it relates to whether or not it is a choice for a man or woman to choose their sexuality? Well, the first thing that I would say to that, you know, um, that it's not a choice, and we kind of hit on this the last time, where do we draw the line? There is a group of people that, you know, they're attracted to children. And there, there are, there have been talks in universities um, about this. There's been discussions about this, right? And so they say, well, I can't help it. You know, I'm attracted to children. We know there's people who are into beastology, you know, so where do we draw the line? They have these individuals, they call them uh, MAP, minor attracted persons. And there's been a lot of studies and discussions where you have people who, you know, they identify as the opposite uh, sex in the trans community and then, you know, they say, well, or even um, the different age, right? They identify as a 12-year-old boy. And that's how they justify, you know, being attracted to a 12-year-old girl. So I would say, where do we draw the line? As far as, like, choosing the hard route, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people who choose the hard route, you know, in life in multiple areas, you know? If you know killing somebody is wrong, if you know committing certain crimes is wrong, uh, selling drugs, whatever it is, you know, there can be consequences to those things. So, you know, people do things for different reasons. Um, you know, people out here living reckless, sleeping around without protection, you know what I'm saying? That's a hard life. There's consequences that come with that. And then of course you have the spiritual perspective. Um, this conversation has come up so many times before. Um, the Bible says two flesh become one. And depending on what you believe, what your doctrine is about demonic spirits, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Um, I personally believe when someone tells me, look, I was born that way, I take it as, you know, from the moment they entered this earth and, you know, they came into, you know, consciousness and started having feelings, those feelings might have been there. The question is, how did those feelings get there? Um, God has not created anyone to be gay because when he created everything, he said it was good. So if someone came out, right, and they're saying they're having these feelings, where did those feelings come from? They didn't come from God. 
because we clearly see that God is a God of order. He has a plan. We talked about it the last time the Bible describes, you know, those desires as vile, as unnatural. Um, and so to me personally, from a spiritual aspect, and people have different opinions about this, you know, it's possible that the Bible, like the Bible's clearer, two flesh become one. So this is why we shouldn't be sleeping around with everybody anyway. But say, you know, I had my parents and say my mom was out there doing whatever and my father was out there doing whatever, sleeping around with whoever. And those people were experimenting and experimenting with people who are on the down low. Right. Those spirits, you become one with that. You come into agreement with that. And so it's possible, you know, those things can affect the children. Right. Spirits, they, they can move. They can move freely. So when someone tells me, hey, I was born that way, obviously I tell them, look, you got to be born again. We were all mm-hmm. born in sin. I won't deny that maybe they have those feelings and have those feelings as a child. But that's where, you know, the spiritual aspect comes in. And I would suggest that they need deliverance. So, so, I, so, so you, I'm, I'm dropping ahead, that right. poll right now. Is homosexuality a choice? And, and Tyshawn, if you don't mind, I do want to ask a question yeah. to uh, the pastor. So I did want to ask you guys, what would be the difference between a homosexual desire and a desire to, let's say, sleep with a bunch of women? So, uh, I, I, so before I answer that, let me first invite some precision um, because I'm, I typically a- answer the questions that I'm asked. And so with the question being, um, is homosexuality a choice? There's one answer to give to that. If the question is, and then I heard it characterized as lifestyle and behavior. If the question is, is someone's sexual behavior a choice? then you'll get a different answer from me because I do believe that everyone's sexual behavior is a choice. And so when we talk about homosexuality, we're not talking about a lifestyle. We're not talking about behavior. We're talking about innate sexual attractions. And so I want to just invite that that clarity um, as we move forward in the conversation. Um, you asked the question. Do you mind repeating it? Well, that makes sense. So now that you you, you bring that perspective and could you re, could you repeat that last statement again? You said homo. You said I guess you gave us a difference between homosexuality yeah. as so what a he was choice saying versus pretty, it being sex versus sexual behavior. Sexual behavior, mm-hmm. and then what was the last statement? Pretty much what he stated was that it's innate sexual, uh, the innate sexual attraction. Attraction, okay. right? So going into it, and did you want to keep in the direction you were going? Well, I, I'm a, I'm gonna hold it because I, I kind of want to get some more perspective before I ask my question, before I follow up with it. Yeah. No. Okay. Cool. Because I think I think this is a, this is a big crux of the conversation here because what we're trying to do is figure out what's wrong, and in the Bible, I think we can really pin down what's wrong as a sin, right? Because what we're trying to do is as best as possible not sin, live as righteous and holy as possible. So what really comes down to is homosexuality a sin? Because if homosexuality is a sin, then it is clearly wrong. So let's get some perspective to that. I'll go right back here to you and Will to this one. Would you define or classify homosexuality as a sin? I would no more classify homosexuality as a sin as I would heterosexuality. (laughs) When we understand human... Is this serious? (laughs) All right, let's keep listening. Lord, help me. Sexuality as a whole, we've got a duality. When we understand human sexuality as a whole, we've got to understand something. And we've got to make sure that we don't conflate the Bible uh, as some sort of guide to human sexuality because it is not. And when we try to make the Bible be that, we actually do violence to the Bible. Um, And so when we talk about the whole issue of sin, I think one of the reasons that this issue has the church in a chokehold is because defining sin is difficult for most people. And let me tell you why that is. Uh, First John three, verse four, sin is the transgression of God's law. Yeah, we know the word sin in itself means to miss the mark, but it's to miss the mark of God's glory. Right, for all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. So let's see what he does with that. When we when we look at the root of what is sin, sin is missing the mark. When you look in Romans chapter 3 and 23, you look in the original language, it simply means missing the mark. It's actually an archery term. And so 
when you talk about missing the mark, you've got to ask yourself, what is the mark? Is that mark the same for everyone? Uh, is that mark simply living out the thing that each of us has been called to be? Because the mark is the Ten Commandments, buddy. <laughs> I don't know why you're trying to confuse people here. Truth is, is what may be sin for one may not necessarily be sin for another. No, no, no. Are you serious? This is what may be sin for one may not necessarily be sin for another. This is the problem. This is the problem. So we have standards that is that is being used and applied for a different class of people. Now, it's one thing you're talking about personal struggle. It's one thing you're talking about areas of growth in the, in the spiritual journey. We can understand the idea of a mark. But when you're talking about sin, there is one standard for that. And that is the law of God. And that's the Ten Commandments. To break the law of God is to sin. So... There is no other mark. You cannot personalize this thing. So that may be sin for you and that may be sin for him. You talking about postmodernism. You bringing into this idea, this is truth for you and that is not truth for me. This is a major problem, man. When you're hearing this coming from ministers, it's very concerning. This goes to show there are some people that will never repent, irrespective of what the Bible says. They will never repent. And I'm not condemning these men. But when you have an ideology like this, this is Greek philosophy at its finest. You're confusing what the Bible has made simple. And what I have come to understand is, is when we speak of being holy or speak of holiness, we have to understand that holiness is rooted in wholeness, honesty, authenticity, clarity about who each of us have been created to be. And so for me to live out my truth, understanding that my nature... There we go. My truth. No wonder why I'm wearing this shirt. <laughs> Revelation 9, verse 6. Revelation 4, verse 3. This was a gift. Take the rainbow back, somebody. That's the problem right here. My truth. What do you mean? What do you mean your truth? Truth is not subjective. It's objective. It's always been objective. Now, we can say there's some element of truth that could be subjective, but when you're talking about truth that is based on the word of God, the foundation of the word, the word of God is alone is objective, irrespective of how you feel, culture, personality, human experiences. It doesn't necessarily matter. Truth is truth. You can either go along with it or go against it. My orientation to live out my truth, understanding that my nature, my orientation is that of the, uh, to the same gender, me being true to that. Mm -hmm does not constitute sin for me. That is not missing the mark. That is my mark. From Brother Marcus, who identifies as a heterosexual person, for him to involve himself in homosexuality or other things that are not true for him, then that is missing the mark because his mark is not necessarily the same as mine. And so we've got to be, we've got to be really very, very careful that we don't paint this with a broad brush. And I'd like to use the word precision that my brother uh, Ramel used. We've got to be very, very clear about what we're talking about and putting things in, in the correct context. And so, no, I don't think that homosexuality is a sin. Now, what, what I would say here, Will, because I think, I think that could be dangerous if we're able to set <clears throat> our own... No, it's not. It could not be. No, no, no. It is dangerous, my friend, because anybody can come and set up their own standard. So if you make your own standard as a homosexual man, well, what about the, the pedophile? What about the bank robber? What about the, the, the sexual abuser? What about the domestic violence? What, what about the murderer? They can set up their own standard too because they have their mark, right? This is a slippery slope. It, it, no, it, the idea it could be dangerous is not, that's not true. It is dangerous. <laughs> that's the point. That could be dangerous if we're able to set <clears throat> our own marks at what is right and what is wrong. Because if I say that, you know, I want to have, I'm, I'm just naturally attracted to 10 year old girls. And that's just the tr attraction I want to have, right? And so you're attracted to, you know, women who are of age. I'm attracted to women who are not. So me having, sex with 10 year old girls because that's what i'm attracted to that's not a sin for me because that's the mark for me so how how do we identify 
what is a healthy mark for us if we pretty much base it person by person? Well, let me add let me add some more context to that, because I've heard uh, you now uh, and Brother Marcus, and I've heard others many times uh, use that partic- particular example of um, pedastrian or pedophilia, where someone says they're attracted to a child. The difference uh, between pedastry or pedophilia and someone's sexual orientation uh, and the way they, they live out their sexuality is when the relationship is between two consenting adults, mm. two people who are of age, who express love for one another, mutual respect for one another, uh, and walk with one another in such a way that is not harmful, that, that's a whole other thing because... What? What? If this was the way we define what is right and wrong, come on, we can move that goalpost anywhere we want. Is this serious right now? Way that is not harmful, that, that's a whole other thing because for an adult person uh, to take advantage sexually of a child... That is harmful. And so we, we can't draw equivalency there. Those are two very, very different things. What about nations where the child's being considered an adult is at the age of 14 or the age of 15, right? Because we have a standard over here. It doesn't necessarily mean it applies everywhere else. It has to go back to, I mean, I mean, the game that this man is playing with the scripture here is so dangerous, so bad. But this is this is what you know when you're unrepentant. This is what you do with the word. You make you. <laughs> this is doing violence to scripture. And again, we are getting no Bible though. We are getting a lot of human uh, uh, speculation, interpretation, guesswork. We're not getting so much scripture either. They're actually, I'm, I haven't heard a single text being quoted from these men. We we can't draw equivalency there. Those are two very very different things. And so I just want to make sure that we don't conflate those two things together. <sighs> Okay. Uh, Before I go over to Marcus, uh, Pastor Ramel, did you have anything to add to is homosexuality a sin? Uh, I certainly don't believe that it is a sin. Um, I've done, unfortunately, I I did a six week course on this subject. I wrote a 300 page book on the subject. So trying to reduce the explanation, trying to explicate that answer into a 60 second soundbite is not really going to work. Um, but no, I absolutely do not believe in homosexuality or because I'm, I asked for that precision or same sex romantic affection and behavior within a context of covenant. I don't believe that either of those are seen. Okay. Marcus, um, oh what, what you, all right, it's gonna, it's gonna cook it up though. I'm going to give Marcus a lot of respect. His answer is long but it's needful. I want you to hear what he does in comparison to what these men are doing. Listen to what Marcus is about to do. That right there is amazing. Take some notes. After his answer, we're going to have to end because that video is almost four hours long and I would encourage you to check it out because that stuff is deep. Now, not deep in a sense of what I'm thinking, but deep as far as confusion is concerned. (laughs) Anyway, let's go on. Listen. What you got on this one here, brother? Homosexuality, is it or is it not a sin? It's definitely a sin. I got a couple of issues with a couple of things that he said about the Bible not being the guide, uh, you know, for sexuality. The Bible is the guide for everything. Anybody who is a believer, John 8, 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believe on him, if ye continue in my words, then are ye my disciples indeed. If you don't follow Jesus' words, you're not his disciples. Now, obviously, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect, but we strive to follow his words. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. So every scripture that is in the text is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. When he talked about everybody living out their truth, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man and the end of that way is death. So everybody has their ways and their thinking. The Bible says lean not to your own understanding. And that's why we come back to the word of God. The word of God is the foundation for everything. If you look at the scripture from the very beginning, God spoke a word, and when he spoke a word, he set things into order. 
like the, the foundation of the world is built on the word of God. The rules of gravity, the rules of reproduction is built off the word of God. It all started with the word of God. And so you can just go through the scriptures. Uh, I'll read a couple real quick. I don't want to debo the conversation, but I'll just try to get this thought out. Take your you time, know, Marcus. You're good. You know, Leviticus 18.22, everybody knows it. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. If you go back and you look at the text, we just read that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we cannot take away from the scripture. The Bible also says not to add, not to take away uh, from the scripture, Deuteronomy 4.2. And so then you start looking at the, all the texts in context from Genesis, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians, we'll start there, 11.3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. So we talked about order, God's word establishing order. God is saying this is the order for a marriage. This is an order for the family. The husband is the head of the wife, not the husband is the head of the husband. We can't have co-heads. That's disorder. Christ is the head of the husband and the husband is the head of the wife. So God created man with a clear, distinct role and purpose when it comes to family. We see that all throughout the Bible, 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those in his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We see in nature, going back again, God's order, right? His word. Some people argue there's homosexual animals. Even in nature, you'll see two male lions, right, fighting over a pride of female lions. You'll never see two gay lions fighting over a bunch of male gay lions to the side, right? So that's not that's not the law of nature, and the law of nature is based off God's word. And so I end with this creation, Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This is God's word setting things into order. Genesis 2.24 states, therefore a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh, all right? Not man clings to his husband or a woman clings to her wife. The key here is they become one flesh. And so when there is order and there is one flesh, we can reproduce. God pulled Eve out of Adam, right? So when a man finds a wife, he's reconnecting with the missing piece, that is why two flesh become one. A man is not going to find that with another man. A woman is not going to find that in another woman. God made man in his image, took the woman out of man, and then when they come back together, right, it's two flesh becoming one. And so when a man connects with a woman, he's tapping into that part that is missing from him. He's reconnecting. He's becoming whole. You can't do that with a man tapping into a man. And oh, by the way, he said, you know, it's not harmful. It is harmful. Romans talks about it. That's why HIV and these things um, are, you know, prominent in the LGBTQ community. A woman can't even tap into an, and I'm not trying to be graphic, but a woman can't even tap into a woman without something artificially being created. And so the point is God made man in his image. He said, that is a reflection of me. And then he pulled the woman out of the man. And he says, when the man comes back with the woman and they connect, they become one. Matthew 19, I'm almost done. My, Matthew 19, 4. Jesus reaffirms, he says, have you not read that he who has made them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and join his, uh, his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. So um, if you have two men come together, they can't reproduce. They can't follow the laws of order. We know that God is a God of order, the Bible says, and Satan is the author of confusion. They cannot, uh, two men cannot produce God's order for reproduction. They cannot produce God's order for the family structure where he said the man is the head of the wife and God is the head of the man. They cannot pr produce God's order for the hierarchy. All right, so he made us in his image. And then we even look, and I'll leave it right here in Ephesians. All right, husbands love your, uh, love your wives, Ephesians 5. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. And then I'll just skip down to the bottom, right? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So essentially, God uses the church, right, as his bride. Christ isn't coming back for another Christ. He's coming back for his bride. And so that marriage between a husband and wife, that, that connection there is a reflection of God's order, and it's a reflection 
of God's church. And so the reason why it is a sin, all right, is because it goes against God's order. This is the Antichrist spirit. So the last verse I'll read, we read it the last time, but I'll read it again, Romans 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. So the glory of the uncorruptible God, I made man in my image. I pulled the woman from man. And this is why Adam says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. A man can't go to another man and be like, you are the bone of my bone, the flesh of my flesh. Right. Because a man wasn't pulled from a man. It was a woman that was pulled from a man and we're reconnecting to create that unity. And so. Uh, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corrupt the man and the birds and forfeit the beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart. So somebody says, look, I was born that way. Yeah, okay, you were born with lust in your heart. You got to be born again to, dis- uh, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use. So we see it there again, the natural order that God established in his word. And Jesus said, you're my disciples. If you continue on in my word from the beginning of time is this is what's natural. A man with a woman reproducing, becoming one flesh. Women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. That's where we talked about the lions. You'll never see two gay male lions fighting for a pride of male lions. And likewise, also the man leaving the natural use of the woman burning their lust toward one another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves the recompense of their error, which was met. So when you say it's not harmful, even the Bible mentions that there's consequences for that kind of lifestyle. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a retrobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So it's not convenient. It's not beneficial. uh, It's not natural. All these things, Verses are very clear about this. So when we look at God's order and we take into context, Jesus said, you are my disciple if you continue on in my words. And we look at that verse where it says all scripture is given for inspiration by God. The Bible is the constitution of every believer. You cannot say you're a Christian and you go against uh, the word of God. Now, it looks like, uh, you know. Wow. I mean. (laughs) That's the end of the argument. At least it should be. I mean, I counted at least 17 verses here. Well done, Marcus Rogers. Well done. This is how you respond. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. By the way, they went on to make some responses. Their response was an attack on the word. There was no argument with what Marcus Rogers presented. I I would encourage you to watch the rest of it. Their response was, you can't use the word like that. This, this is not how the word was meant to be used. Uh, friends, I'm telling you, we are living in serious times. We are living in serious times. So let me, let me pull my final, my final little text here because we don't want to make this video any longer than it needs to be. All right, listen to what it says here. Let none say, I cannot remedy my defects of character. If you come to this conclusion, you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. The impossibility lies in your own will. Did you hear that? Your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an incentivized heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of God. And I'm going to read something else. Let's read the next paragraph here. To the heart that has become purified, all is changed. Transformation of character is the testimony of the world of an indwelling Christ. The Spirit of God produces a new life in a soul, bringing the thoughts and desires into obedience to the will of God, to the will of Christ. And the inward man is renewed in the image of God. Weak and erring men and women show to the world that the Redeemer power of grace can cause the faulty character to develop into symmetry and abundant fruitfulness. Prophets and Kings, page 233. So the point is, it all goes back to the indwelling Christ and a willingness to overcome. 
And if there is a will to overcome that is willing to be submissive to God's will, we are told that the indwelling Christ will give you the victory. It is not in you. It is in Christ. It is not by might, we are told, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So the gay man has hope. The homosexuals have hope. The bank robber has hope. Okay, the lesbians have hope today because of the indwelling power of the grace of Christ in the soul. That in itself, Christ in his righteousness in the man will transform that which was corrupt and sinful to that which is righteous and holy. This is the victory over sin. And the heart must submit to the will of of God. So stop saying you can't get victory. Stop saying you don't have a choice. Stop saying you can't help yourself. If you give your hearts over to the Lord, if you choose to believe you can overcome by the grace of Christ, you will overcome and victory will be yours. As far as this discussion is concerned, I will tell you, you need to go and watch the rest of it. I mean, <laughs> I was having, I was having a difficult time making my way through this thing, but you hear the difference in perspective. What did you hear? You heard the gospel, the word of God versus human intelligence. And again, every man must choose for themselves, which one they're going to believe. Anyway, friends, much more could be said. Link in the description below, like, and subscribe to the page. Click the bell icon for more. If you enjoyed this video, I appreciate you. Thank you for watching this video. I'll see you on the next one. Have a good one. Bye.